Hey, Terry O'Donnell here from KISS1023 in Albany, New York. Hanging out with my uh, favorite trainer in the world, Jay Vincent, who has helped me shed 11 pounds in less than two weeks. Jay, tell us who you are. My name is Jay Vincent. I'm the owner and head trainer of a high-intensity training studio in Clifton Park called BioFit Personal Training. I instruct uh, evidence-based, science-proven exercise methods and uh, help people get in shape, build strength, and everything in between in just two 30-minute workouts a week. And you cut through a lot of the fitness BS that's out there because there's a lot of that. That's exactly a lot of myths. right. That's exactly right. The waters have become muddied, so uh, half of my job is to help people get the information they need and kind of decipher from uh, what's true and what is just complete garbage. And tell us what we're going to talk about today. We have a famous person on the line. Yes, today we <laughs> <laughs> You hear that, Mark? You're famous. We have I a... Go ahead. I didn't realize I was famous, but... <laughs> well, we're going to make you famous. <laughs> we have okay. a uh, former strength conditioning coach, uh, Mark Asanovich. He's coached for uh, various NFL teams, including the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, utilizing high-intensity training principles, which I instruct at my training studio, and has had massive success making his athletes strong and uh, with withstand injury. So, uh, Mark Asanovich... Pleasure to have you on. Been very excited to speak to you personally. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, to Terry and Jay, it's an honor to be on the show. Excellent. So um, I'd like to start off just asking you about your background, um, where uh, you studied exercise science, how you got into strength coaching, and uh, I guess we'll start from there. So where, where did you study exercise science? Did you uh, go to college for it, or how did this all begin? I did. I I tell people I I turned my hobby into my profession. I was always one of those um, guys that wanted to be a a good athlete, but I had no talent. So I was always the try-hard guy. The try-hard guy is the guy who um, goes from whistle to whistle and just never stops. (laughs) And so that meant I had to be in the best shape possible. So... um, you know, from a very early age, I was I was um, trying to improve my um, physical abilities through strength training. Mm-hmm. Um, I did uh, get get a degree, a master's degree from the Ohio State University in exercise science. Um, I actually got an undergraduate degree at St. Cloud State University, and I had a coaching minor. And the reason why I kind of took the back door in, um, I knew that if I taught, I could coach. So, um, uh, but then when I got into the coaching and I enjoyed it so much um, and wanted to get it in, into it professionally, then I went to um, Ohio State University and got my uh, degree in exercise uh, science. Excellent. Um... So studying exercise science, um, were you introduced to principles that kind of ran alongside high-intensity training principles, or was it something completely different? Well, um, I was was very fortunate uh, in my career to have uh, uh, some really great mentors uh, when I was learning the business. Choosing to go to Ohio State was pivotal for me because what was being taught then and what is being taught even today is mainly principles that were uh, founded through the NSCA, the National Strength Coaches Association. And um, a little history for you, um, even 50 years ago, Strength training, because of all the misconceptions, was something that most coaches told their athletes not to partake of, um, because it would make, it would make you muscle bound. A translation: it, you'd have big muscles and it would slow you down. Mm-hmm. Another myth that was out there was um, it would make you um, um, tight. You know, you you, you can't. Um, uh, lift weights because it would make you inflexible. So about 50 years ago, people were saying, you know, stay away from strength training. Um, what's interesting to me now is going through that, living through that, is now 
strength training has gone from don't lift weights to a panacea where strength training is um, uh, the answer to everything in athletic development. Not not do you not only get strong and make morphological changes in the muscle, but uh, I don't know if you know this, Jay, but you, apparently you develop mental toughness as well. Yeah, I've heard something along those lines too, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence that uh, you know very intense conditioning or strength training protocols will make you mentally tough. So, what's your take on that? I've taken some um, very high-profile athletes and very um, you know high-caliber athletes in the NFL through very um, very challenging workouts to the point where. After the workout, um, uh, they're laying on the floor for 20 minutes in a pool of sweat uh, before they get up. And um, that individual uh, many times would be, uh, it'd be fourth and one, and the game would be on the line, and that individual would jump offside. Hmm. So how mentally tough were they? And does hard strength training, developmental toughness, I don't know. Like you said, we have no evidence to support something like that. But my contention is I don't know where along my career all of a sudden uh, I was responsible for developing mental toughness. Um, I think um, I think coaches use that as a, as a um, excuse many times. And um, so... Getting back to my point, first we said don't do it. Now we're doing it for everything, not only strength training, mental toughness, but apparently now you can uh, develop sports skills in the weight room too by assimilating uh, sport movements under load. Mm -hmm. And, uh, again, anybody that studied biomechanics understands that if you change a skill infinitesimally, I mean, just changing it just a little bit, neurologically, you're teaching an individual a different skill. It's called the principle of specificity for a reason. Skills are specific. They are not almost like or similar to. In order to improve a skill, you must do the exact skill. Doing a skill under load changes the original skill and now you're teaching them to do something else so again we've gone from don't lift weights to now it is a panacea for anything everything so, so i like to tell coaches you know hey sometimes a cigar is just a cigar strength training is exactly that it's a um it is a modality to increase the morphological characteristics and the metabolic characteristics of the body. And that's it. Right. So using a weighted bat before stepping out to the plate in the MLB or shooting a weighted basketball, that's not going to improve your ability on the field or on the court. That's correct? That's absolutely correct. And uh, in when I talk to MLB hitting coaches, uh, and I bring that up, the, many of them will just roll their eyes because they understand that swinging a weighted bat and uh, with a sleeve or without a sleeve are completely two different skills. But many of them have told me that swinging weighted bats have become such a part of the baseball culture that to not have those sleeves on deck would mentally throw off his hitters or their hitters uh, even more. So they're willing to give them the sleeve so that they go up there mentally feeling like they're ready to hit the ball. Gotcha. So they, the uh, strength and conditioning coaches are aware that it doesn't produce or provide any benefit prior to actually stepping up to the plate and trying to hit the ball. They do Many of them do, yes. Psychological purposes because they were brought up to do that for so long that it, I mean, baseball players are very superstitious. We know that. So if they were to take that away, they would believe it might throw off their whole their whole hitting game. Yep. Okay, gotcha. 
So, um, no, I was always curious. How exactly did you discover it? Was it was it a mentor um, in particular, or did you read or study some of Arthur Jones' um, principles back back in the day? Well, I, uh, you know, like I said, I was I was very fortunate in my career to um, have a number of great mentors. Uh, you know, for a young kid learning the business, I mean, I was able to learn under Dan Riley, Kim Wood, Jim Flanagan, Ted, Teddy Lambertini, Mike Gittleson, Ken Leisner. Um, uh, where I was first exposed to high intensity training was in my master's degree work at Ohio State. Um, Dr. Ted Lambertini was the assistant strength and conditioning coach at that time, and he was leaving, actually, when I was coming in. Um, but I had a chance to meet him. Uh, I specifically remember he gave me Arthur Jones Bulletins 1 and 2, and I, uh, when I started reading, I actually read them in one day, both Bulletins 1 and 2, and uh, because to me, I never read anything like that before. Uh, that was scientifically based, that was common sense, uh, that was practical. And um, so that was kind of my first exposure to it uh, when I got to Ohio State. Okay. And um, were they, when you got to Ohio State, were they using, um, you know, that those principles during their training currently, or is that something you brought in? It was it was kind of a mix. Okay. It was a kind of a mix at that time. Uh, what they were using, they were using powerlifting techniques as well as high intensity training techniques. Um, but I, I do have to tell you this, Jay. One of the things, obviously, it was the science that drew me most to this style of training. But was what was interesting was I used to take uh, summer trips every year. And I would, I would choose a conference. So one year I went to all the schools in the Big Ten. One year I went to all the schools in the SEC and the ACC and Pac-12 at that time, at Pac-10. And um, what also drew me to high-intensity training was in, in, in these trips traveling around the country, I would uh, bring a video camera with me and I would interview uh, the strength coaches, and I asked them the same four questions. The first question is, what is strength? What is your definition of strength? And then given that definition, my second question was, how best do you develop it? And then what are the best strength training modalities for developing strength? And then I also asked them for a statement on uh, anabolic steroids. And what was interesting to me was uh, when I would ask high-intensity strength training coaches those questions, it was always the same answers. And it was very consistent. When I asked coaches that weren't practicing those, t- it was all over the map what, what they were um, coming up with. The other thing that that really attracted me to high intensity training um, was the character of the individuals that were practicing this. You know, guys like Dan Riley and Kim Wood and Flanagan and Mike Gittleson and stuff like that. These were really high character guys. They were teachers. They were professionals. They were guys that were rolling up their sleeves on the floor, coaching and teaching. And you would talk to the players uh, about them, and they were almost like father figures. Whereas um, on the other side of the coin, again, you, you got stuff that was all over the map. Were there some professionals? Absolutely. But I remember being out at a, um, a school one time, a Division One school. I'm not going to mention the name, but... Um, uh, the strength coach, as soon as we got done with the interview, I was staying that night there in that town, and uh, we were going to go out to eat. Well, before we went out to eat, uh, he was 
he parked in a neighborhood, and I was wondering what was going on. He goes, come on, you know, and stuff like that. We're running through these people's yards. And then we're looking in the windows of this, of this house, and I'm thinking, what the heck is going on here? Well, apparently his wife had thrown him out, and she had a restraining order out, but he was just kind of checking to see what was going on. He thought maybe she was, um, you know, had another boyfriend or something like that. But my point here is the character of the individuals that were involved in high-intensity training were, were guys that I respected, that I looked up to, that were teachers and professionals, and uh, scientists, so um, that 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 also had an effect on me. Yeah, it seems it seems that those who advocate high intensity training principles advocate more evidence based opinions on almost anything, and mm-hmm. don't really don't really like to take anything based on faith or just um, intuition. Um, so that's the that's the trend I've noticed between and honestly, without being too harsh, it seems that those who who uh, advocate high intensity training principles they're a little more intelligent. They'll actually they yeah. they have developed relatively good critical thinking skills to look at a situation, analyze it, and figure out what the commonality is between them. And it seems that uh, a lot of bodybuilding or uh, even strength and conditioning modalities these days. They're based off of what the best athletes or the best bodybuilders do. Now, we have a term for that, and it's called uh, selection bias. And it seems that has kind of taken, taken hold of the fitness industry. Um, so it seems something took a wrong turn. So, you know, what I'd like to uh, focus on right now is let's talk about how exactly the muscle stimulation and uh, response and adaptation process happens. I don't think a lot of people really understand this process, and that's why um, all sorts of other techniques and modalities make sense to them, but I think once they understand the basic physiology behind this, high-intensity training might make sense. So if you could, give us a rundown of how this happens, how the body is stimulated, even a very uh, layman way of explaining the chemical process that, that takes place, and, um, you know, just the stimulus, response, and adaptation process. Just give us a, a brief rundown of it. Sure. And uh, let, me, let me make this point uh, before I get into physiology. And you know this, Jay, but um, for those that are listening, the reason we are in the situation we are is you, you need to take a historical retrospect of uh, what has happened in the United States. Um, like I said, 50 years ago, there wasn't a lot of strength training at all. Um, so my question is, what changed that? Well, there were a lot of uh, things that happened. But suffice it to say, when coaches realized the importance of strength training, where did they turn? Did they did they go to the exercise physiology chairman at their respected university? Did they go to the scientists and say, who is your brightest mind that can coach and teach this to my team? Is that where they went? Did they go to the scientists? No. Certainly did not. What coaches did is what 16-year-olds do, males do now even today. They go to the gym and they look for the biggest person in the gym. They, and that's what coaches did. They went to power lifters. They went to Olympic weightlifters. And it was almost like credibility by association. They look apart. So if you think about this, if our first experts in our country today were power lifters and Olympic weightlifters, what do you think the mainstream strength training methodologies are going to be today? That makes perfect sense. I mean, um, I tell people to a hammer, everything's a nail. If I'm a power lifter, you are going to bench and you're going to squat. 
if you're an Olympic weightlifter, you are going to clean and you're going to snatch. So is it any wonder that right now in the mainstream, in strength training in the United States today, you see a combination of powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting, and you see very little evidence-based strength and conditioning. Now, a caveat to that is this. There was one very intel I hate to say this being, a, being an Ohio State guy, but there was one coach in the United States at that time that did go to the exercise physiology chairman at his university, and um, that was at Michigan. Bo Schembechler went to the... Um, chairman of the physiology department, he said, who's your brightest mind? And for the next 27 years, Mike Gittleson ran the strength and conditioning coach at the University of Michigan. Wow. Now, as far as the physiology goes, um, uh, strength training isn't real um, difficult to understand. Um, uh, it it's an evolving science. Uh, Dr. Barr out in San Diego has written some great papers on P76 kinase and the mTOR pathway and all that stuff. Um, but, but basically what we have to do in a given set of exercise in order to get strong is you have to stimulate the muscle tissue, okay? Uh, we call that overload. You have to take the muscle beyond what it's used to doing. And um, when you do that, when you cross that threshold, you set in motion a chain reaction of physiological processes that if you give it the proper rest and the proper nutrition, will result in a physiological adaptation. And those adaptations are... Uh, changes in muscle size, uh, primarily if you're males, you're not going to see the size in females. Um, in strength, in metabolic adaptations, in flexibility adaptations. I'll tell you this, Jay, there is no known exercise, known to man, that is more productive and beneficial than progressive resistance exercise. If there is a fountain of youth, you're going to find it in the weight room. Um, because yeah, seen there is more bang now, for yeah. the buck. Yeah, there is more physiological bang for the buck that you're going to get from progressive resistance exercise than any form of exercise known to man. So what you're saying, Mark, is... Progressive resistance exercise, intense resistance training, will cause an adaptation in the cardiovascular system, muscular strength, endurance, flexibility, even stability, all of those factors? Absolutely. And there's no exercise known to man that will give you better results uh, that you had mentioned, those adaptations. Now... When it comes to training athletes or athletes training for um, strength and conditioning, it seems a lot of them, as we said earlier, are adopting uh, Olympic lifts. You know, um, I've, I've spoken to um, uh, local colleges, and they're all practicing Olympic lifts like the, uh, um, obviously, the deadlift and the, the snatch and those sorts of things. Now, the idea behind this is you must train explosively to be explosive and that will translate to your performance on the field. Now, you and I both know that there is something wrong behind that logic, but could you explain briefly what the fault in that, um, that assumption is and why that isn't true, and also yeah. the problems with Olympic lifts for strength and conditioning for athletes? Absolutely. In fact, um, I spoke in February down in Orlando uh, on this very topic, and uh, left most of the audience in utter uh, shock. Um, you have to understand that in the athletic world, in the, the business of coaching and um, athletics, this is a copycat industry. 
So um, most coaches will um, copy successful programs. So down in Orlando, I had just got done talking about the dangers and perils of doing Olympic quick lifts. And a coach raised his hand and said, but, but, but coach, Alabama does this. Okay. Um, then I, I, so then I, my answer was, well, did you know that Indiana State, Indiana State that won one football game this year does the same thing Alabama does? Okay. So what's the difference? What they both do cleans. Why isn't Indiana State having the success that Alabama has? There's a lot of inferences that are made uh, regarding these lifts. The other thing you have to understand is there's a um, clear differentiation between coaching a sport and coaching strength and conditioning. Coaching a sport is based on philosophy. Now, philosophy is a system of beliefs. Um, Tony Dungy, when he ran our offense and defenses down in Tampa, had a certain philosophy, uh, certain beliefs on what would win in the National Football League. And that's how he based his decisions. Uh, but in the weight room, it's not based on uh, philosophy. It is based on physiology. And in science, we have to run our programs based on scientifically sound principles. And coaches have an under, have a hard time understanding that. Um, when coaches ask me, what's your philosophy on strength training? I tell them I don't have one. I don't have the luxury of having a philosophy because I have to follow the physiology. And a lot of times they're taken aback by that, but that's the reality of coaching strength training as opposed to coaching sport. So I'm sorry, Jay, I went off on another tangent. Now, okay. What was your question again? You know, more so why, why they're adopting the use of oh, Olympic lifts. Oh, yeah, lifts. yeah, let's get back to the Olympic lifts. Mm -hmm. So anyways, we have this copycat industry now that is tied up into uh, the Olympic quick list. Because the inference, as you said, is if you train fast, you'll be fast. So in other words, if you throw weights using momentum in the weight room, you will be more powerful and explosive out on the field. There's a couple things wrong with that. First of all, it's extremely, extremely dangerous. Uh, four years ago in the British um, Journal of Sports Medicine, there was a um, uh, research article published, and what the researcher did is he took a look at all the sports around the world, and what he wanted to find out was what sport was the most injury-producing sport in all the world. And he did this per capita. And uh, what he found out was the top most dangerous sport in all the world, world per capita was, in fact, Olympic weightlifting. Number two was powerlifting. And number three was American football. Now, think about this, Jay. If, if those are the top three and how we're trying to train American football players now is through Olympic weightlifting and powerlifting, and then you're in a very dangerous sport, is it any wonder that we have um, unbelievable injury rates in American football today? Wow. They're extremely, extremely dangerous lifts. Uh, they're, uh, the biomechanical loading that goes uh, with um, the Olympic quick lifts uh, tear up your joints. Um, they are highly technical lifts, so you have to spend a lot of time teaching them how to do this correctly. Um, and if there is a breakdown in technique, you're going to have injuries. 
Um, one of the things I've always tried to follow in my career uh, is the third tenant of the uh, Hippocratic Oath. And that tenant is primum non nucri, which simply means first do no harm. So what that translates into in the weight room is if you know a lift is inherently dangerous, you don't do it. It's as simple as that. Or you find some, a substitute that is much safer to do. Um, so the so anyway, they are they are extremely different, um, dangerous, and they're unproductive. Well, the physiology they're behind un- it is to stimulate fast twitch muscle fibers, which is the uh, muscle fiber type mostly responsible for producing a high amount of force, aka speed, explosiveness. Now, right. a high-intensity training or an evidence-based training protocol, you can actually recruit and stimulate these fibers moving quite slowly um, by training to muscle failure. Would you agree? Absolutely. What you're talking about is um, Henneman's principle on muscle fiber recruitment. Henneman's size. Principle, and Henneman's right. principle on muscle fiber recruitment is very specific. It says... Um, Recruitment of muscle fibers is done in a specific and orderly fashion, meaning that the first fibers that fire are the lower electrical threshold fibers, and then it proceeds up the continuum. Uh, so now what we're taking a look at is the uh, neural innervations of the different fiber types. And slower twitch fibers have smaller circumference diameters that innervate those fibers. They are stimulated very easily because they have smaller fibers, whereas fast-twitch fibers have uh, larger uh, neural um, innervations. So an analogy would be um, compare the cord of a um, lamp to the cord uh, going into a washer dryer. The circumference sizes are quite a bit different because uh, the electricity carried over a small cord, uh, the electricity it takes to run a light bulb is a lot different than it takes to run a washer or dryer. The same holds true in your body. Uh, it takes higher electrical voltages to run fast twitch fibers. So there's a very orderly pattern of recruitment. It goes from low threshold to high threshold, and you cannot change that by changing your speed of movement in the weight room. You, you, can, um, you can move quickly in the weight room on the first rep. You're still going to recruit slow-twitch fibers. And the problem with that, too, is the um, names of the fibers, slow-twitch, fast-twitch. People, particularly coaches, think slow-twitch fibers refer to the twitch speed. You know, they think that there are slow contracting fibers Mm -hmm. and fast contracting fibers, when in fact, the slow and the fast refer to their glycolytic properties, meaning there are slow fatiguing fibers and there are fast fatiguing fibers. So if you're like most coaches and you don't understand that physiology, it kind of makes sense to a coach when some when um, somebody says, if you want to selectively recruit fast switch fibers, you must move fast. You know, if, if you don't understand the physiology, there is some rationale there. But the thing you have to understand is when it comes to twitch speed, if you're going to increase the twitch speed of the fiber, there are only four mechanisms, cellular mechanisms, that are responsible for that. And again, this is something you can look up in the literature. The first is what's called uh, myosin ATPase. It's an enzyme. And science says that if you have a higher density of myosin ATPase uh, within the fiber, it will contract at a higher rate. The other uh, cellular mechanism has to do with what's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And science says if you have a higher developed 
more highly developed sarcoplasmic reticulum, um, the cell, the muscle cell will contract at a faster rate. Now, what's the sarcoplasmic reticulum? If you ever take a look at a house being built, when it's in its framing stage, the framing of the muscle cell is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the third mechanism is um, troponin's affinity for calcium. So troponin uh, is involved in the actual um, mechanics of muscle contraction. And um, when muscle contracts, calcium is released within the um, cell. It binds with troponin. Troponin moves and now actin and myosin are able to do their thing, and we have contraction. Well, another name for affinity is sensitivity. So if troponin is more sensitive to calcium, it binds faster, and it basically turns the contraction process on faster. Now, are these all um, genetically predisposed traits? Well, I'm getting to that. Okay. Um, let me let me get to the fourth one, and that is what we had just talked about, and that is the diameter of the nerve that innervates the fiber. And as I said, if the di- if the nerve carries a higher electrical voltage, the cell will contract at a faster rate. So, other than just bore your uh, listeners now for the last four minutes on physiology, what have I just identified? What I've just identified are the four cellular mechanisms, because there's only these four, that will allow a cell to contract at a faster rate, which in theory then would make them a more powerful explosive athlete. So the question is this. If you're doing Olympic uh, quick lifts in your weight room, My question to that coach is, what is the physiological adaptation you are looking for in doing that specific lift that is going to affect one of those four cellular mechanisms? Is by doing a snatch or a clean in the weight room going to increase myosin ATPase densities? Is it going to increase the sarcoplasmic reticulum development? Is it going to increase troponin's affinity for calcium? Is it going to increase the diameter of the nerve innervating that muscle? And the answer to all four of those questions is no, because as you said, those are all genetically determined. So You in- cannot get a cell to contract faster. Those are all determined by your genetics. So more or less, a fast explosive athlete is more so born than they are made in the weight room and training. Is that right? Absolutely. And how do you make somebody faster? You make them more mechanically efficient at doing their particular skill. As they become more efficient at doing their skill, they will be able to apply their force much faster. So in that case, is there is there any um, is there any validity in agility training? I know when I played uh, college football, I did uh, you know the ladder or or kind of broad jumps and all that kind of stuff. Um, is there any reason to be doing that? Is that going to translate, for instance, for running back's ability to change direction on the field or anything in that matter? No. Again, uh, we have we have what's called the law of specificity. And again, if you look up the word specific in a dictionary, it's not going to define specific as something that's almost like or similar to. Specificity is defined as identical, exactly like. So if you want to, what the research says, if you want to become a better running back, What you need to do is you need to go in the weight room and get strong, and then you need to be taught on how to express that strength through the proper mechanics on the field to do that. Uh, Agility drills, you talked about agility drills. Um, You know, from a conditioning standpoint, that might be um, uh, 
something you may want to do, but from is it going to actually translate to better performance on the field? The research shows that that's not, not true at all. Right. Now, when it comes to making an athlete stronger, and in your experience in the NFL and training what I would call genetic freaks in terms of athletes, what have you found in terms of exercise regimens, uh, structure, um, maybe programming um, that was most effective for training these high-level athletes or football players for uh, that matter? So in terms of like a, a typical workout routine and how many sets, the rep range, et cetera. Okay. So the first time I would see my new players and rookies every year was always at minicamp. And um, what I would do is is uh, the rookies and the uh, free agents that we had signed in the off season would meet with me in a meeting. Uh, basically, we called it an orientation meeting. Um, in my opening statement, all 14 years I was in the NFL was, um, gentlemen, you're all, you know, whatever team I was on, you're all Tampa Bay Buccaneers now. And just like you're going to have to get used to new offensive, defensive, and special team schemes, you're probably going to have to get used to a new style of training. I know most of you come from universities where you've done um, variations of Olympic lifting and power lifting. Gentlemen, we ain't doing that here. And what was always interesting to me was the reaction. Because usually the reaction was them wiping their brow going, I hated doing that stuff anyway. So there was really never a problem. But every now and then it happened four times in my 14 years where after that meeting, um, because in the meeting I described exactly what you asked, most of the things we're going to do are very basic exercises. We're going to um, um, prescribe exercises that train every muscle in your body because guess what, gentlemen? You'll use every muscle out on the football field. So the training application is if you're going to use them, we must train them. So they were prescribed total body training programs. Now, some exercises we did one set, some two set, three set, four set. What the literature says there is whether you're doing one, two, three, four, ten sets, your outcomes are all going to be equal based on the intensity of the ex exercise. Okay, so if you're getting the same result doing 10 sets as you did one set, um, why would you do the other nine sets? It's wasted time. So during the season, we told our players, get used to doing single set training because it is the most efficient way to train. We've got to practice. You've got to be in meetings. We want you to be, have time with your families. We want you to have time where you recover. Um, so most of the stuff, we're tied into doing single set systems because we still have to train your whole body. And as football players, the most critical area that we train is going to be the muscles around your cervical spine, your head and neck muscles. Um, now in the off season, when they have a lot of time for variety and to avoid monotony. If you want to get into doing uh, multiple set protocols, fine. We can, we can do that in the off season, but in the in season, this is what we're going to do. So this, this was some of the dialogue we had in this orientation meeting. Well, um, I remember very specifically in Jacksonville, we had signed a uh, free agent linebacker out of, um, uh, East Tennessee University. And after, he, he was a free agent. He wasn't drafted, uh, because the word on him was he wasn't real bright. Now he looked the part. Uh, you know, he looked like, um, uh, Tarzan. He was a linebacker and, uh, he was very well developed. 
after the meeting, he came up and he said, Coach, he said, all that Olympic stuff, I got to do that. That's what brought me to the dance. Now, as a coach, as a strength coach, when you hear that, if I had cut him off and said, you ain't doing it, I mean, mentally, what what would I have done to that player? Yeah, he would feel like he's missing out, and he would blame his lack of performance on the field on you. Exactly. In the back of his mind, he's going to say, that jerk wouldn't let me prepare. I'm not ready. And certainly it's going to have an influence on his program, whether he blames me or not for it. In his mind, it's going to have an effect on his performance. So what I would do with those individuals, and it happened four times, is I would take them back to my office, and I would show them exactly, um, you know, what physiologically and orthopedically those kind of things do to their bodies. And I would explain to them that your goal as a professional athlete is not to win rings, (laughs) Your goal is to get to the next contract and the next contract and the next contract. You're a professional. You get paid. And the longer you're around, the longer you're going to provide for your family. If you do these things, you are going to hurt your career and hurt by getting hurt in the weight room. You ain't getting paid if you're hurt. You're not going to get to that next contract. Well, In three out of four instances, uh, because I said I had four exceptions, three out of four of them, they got up and they said, Coach, you're right. You know, I'll I'll do whatever you say. But this one individual, he said, Coach, I still got to do it. So what I did is I had to drop a waiver statement that he and his agent had to sign because in the NFL you can't cut uh, injured players. Um, so it's a pretty big deal. They had to sign that we've been informed of all the dangers of doing Olympic quick list. And in fact, if I get hurt in the weight room, they, the team can cut me. And they signed that waiver. And what I did with this individual is I made him come in either very early in the morning or very uh, late in the afternoon after all the other players had left. And I said, Whatever you need to do to prepare, you do it. And that's what he did. And I don't know what they did at East Tennessee at the time, but um, he taught, I saw him do things that I had never seen. And I'd, I'd been around a while by that time. He even did a thing, uh, Jay, called a, um, a box match. You know what that is? I can, let me guess. He jumped onto a box and tried to do a snatch. Exactly. Okay. While he was trying to snatch, he was trying to jump up at the same time on a 16-inch box. And I can't tell you the the number of times I would hear the uh, weights crash to the floor, I'd come running into the room, and this individual would be bleeding, you know, whether he hit his shin or, or, you know, fell down and, and cut himself. And he'd be standing there bleeding, and I, I, I tell him, I said, this has got to tell you something about you're standing there bleeding, man. You know? Man. And he'd, he'd always tell me, oh, no, no, coach, coach, I'm violent. I'm violent. Well, okay, so this goes on all off season. In our first preseason game, uh, because he's an undrafted rookie, he didn't get in until the start of the fourth quarter. Okay. This supposedly violent, supposedly explosive guy. Now, I told you that the word on him was he wasn't real intelligent. That's why he wasn't drafted. Um, because when they put him in, either we were down in Miami playing the Dolphins, and I remember it distinctly. The Dolphins had a third down. They had five yards to go. They were in their territory, and they sent this guy out to be an outside linebacker. Now, I don't know what defense was called, but an outside linebacker in the NFL is going to have to make at least five reads, meaning if the, if the quarterback does this, I must do this. If the running back, though, does this, 
I have to do this. If this guy, if the tight end blocks down, I have to do this. And those reads have to be made very quickly. So the very first uh, play that this individual is in the NFL, um, the Dolphins execute their play. The guard pulls around and knocks this kid right on his butt. And he laid him out. So he comes running off the field, and my question to him, and my question to your audience is this. In that very moment when the ball was snapped, what in fact mattered? And in that moment, what mattered was, was that athlete strong? Could he then take that strength and apply it to productive, efficient movement. And was that individual smart? Because those are the only three things that matter. It didn't matter how many uh, box snatches he did in that moment, how many clean, how many speed ladders he ran through. What mattered was, was he strong, was he skilled, and was he smart? So you're talking about training explosion that's what you have to train you have to get your athletes strong then you have to teach them how to turn that strength into productive mechanics on the field and then you have to make sure that you educate them on the game they know exactly what's going on and that seems to be my belief if you make your body overall stronger you're going to be able to apply that in an environment of your choice for the most part. You're, you're improving your functional ability. And that's where the confusion, confusion comes in. Is that a snatch or a, uh, um, any sort of those ridiculous lifts? They're functional movements. Yeah. Now, I believe that when you make your body stronger overall, you enhance its functional ability overall. So it seems to be that these movements, these functional movements, aren't very necessary for becoming a more functional body. Is that correct? Yeah, and and, my question is, where did these words, these functional stuff come from? I mean, I don't know. uh, You know, yeah, when a coach asks me something like that, I'll ask him, what makes an exercise not functional? And what makes it functional? And... And usually they don't have an answer for that. It's, it's, um, you know, it, it's just nebulous. It's, it's, it's undefined. It's whatever they perceive in their mind is what to them is functional. It's not done through a scientific process. You know what it is? I think it's just marketing. I think it's the ability to market things like battle ropes or boxes. And in order to create classes that seem a bit sexy for people who want to train, like uh, the Nike football ad, and because they've kind of convinced people that um, your performance is based on what you do off the field in terms of strength and conditioning. But as you just said, it's mostly your ability to understand, um, for instance, if you're a defensive player, understand the defense and the offense, understand your, your job and what you're supposed to do, and uh, your ability to apply what you have physiologically on the field and that the amount of training you do off the field is not going to drastically improve your performance on the field right yeah that's exactly it cool. and you know the, the other thing you have to understand is uh, the cdc came out with a um, um study in 2008 and what they looked at is um number of uh, visits to ERs based on um, weight room injuries. And all the stuff that's going on now in the mainstream, how are we doing? Well, between 1990 and 2007, visits to the emergency room based on weight room injuries have increased 50%. You know, you Exercise is supposed to enhance health. It's supposed to enhance performance. In fact, 
with all this Olympic weightlifting and powerlifting type of stuff that we're doing, in fact, it is endangering uh, performance. It is endangering health. I'll tell you this. Um, in 1995, when we took the job down in Tampa, Tony Dungy unleashed what he called the Tampa 2 defense. And for the next five years, our defense was the only defense in the National Football League that was in the top five every single year, those five-year spans. And when I would go to the uh, NFL Combine in Indianapolis every year, my colleagues around the um, league would come up to me and say, man, Tony's Tampa 2 defense, it is violent. It is probably the most explosive defense we've seen in this league in 50 years. And it was. But I kind of like to mess with coaches, so I'd always follow that statement up with, but do you understand in the Tampa weight room, we do the slowest reps of any team in the NFL. And they'd grab their heads and say, well, what are you talking about? I thought you had to train fast to be fast. In fact, we trained slow in the weight room so we could be violent and explosive on the field. Wow. Yes, completely counterintuitive to what most people would think. Now, yeah. in terms of a strength and conditioning uh, protocol for your, for your athletes, what would a typical workout look like? Well, like I, I said uh, when I was talking about the orientation, is uh, it, it's got to start with a total body routine. Um, and the primary emphasis would be on the head and neck muscles. Um, and where where is all that coming from? As a strength and conditioning pro- professional, my first and foremost duty to my players is to prepare them and to protect them for the risks of sport. Um, so what's that risk when you're, when you're playing? I mean, can you hurt your shoulder? Well, yeah, you can hurt your shoulder. Well, what about your elbow? Yeah, well, what about your wrist? What about your knee? What about your ankle? Um, because the body, the total body is exposed to injury, we need to make sure that all the musculature in the total body is trained because we know that when we train muscle tissue, there is a systemic effect on the other systems of the body. What does that mean? Well, in getting the muscles strong, we also get bones strong. Bone mineral density increases, so the bones get stronger and thicker. The tendons and ligaments that hold the bones together become stronger and thicker. The sheathing, the connective tissue around the joints become thicker and stronger. So now we got more structurally sound joints. And stru- more structurally sound joints mean, um, in all cases, less severity and less frequency of injury. Now the most catastrophic thing that can happen in sport is traumatic brain injury, an injury to your brain, or a spinal cord injury. So, again, you apply those same principles to the cervical spine. The first thing our players would do when they came in their room before they trained any other muscle was, in fact, to train the head and neck muscles. Generally, what the, when you put together a strength training prescription, you train your larger muscle groups before your smaller muscle groups. And that is true, but the only exception for me were the head and neck muscles because I didn't want our players training the most important muscles at the end of the workout when they were fatigued. I wanted them fresh because um, in training those muscles, we made the cervical spine thicker and stronger, which protected the spinal cord, and we increased the... Um, muscle strength of the neck, and as you know, the uh, muscles serve as shock absorbers for the body. So um, if we're going to reduce the mechanism of concussion, we have to slow down the head 
And in order to slow down the head, you have to strengthen the muscles of the neck. So a typical workout was start. they'd come in, we'd uh, train their head and neck muscles, we'd train their traps, and then we'd probably move into the larger muscles of either the upper torso or lower torso, and then we'd work on down from um, hips to legs to lower limbs. Then we do the chest, the um, shoulders, the lats, um, and then we'd finish up with the uh, abdominal and low back muscles. Excellent. So very, uh, what I like to practice in my studio are very basic multi-joint movements. Is that something you followed as well? Exactly. We always talked about doing very basic movements at a brutally high level of intensity for a brief amount of time. So you can get all of the strength and uh, exercise benefits out of very basic multi-joint movements. So you don't need all these others, other uh, Turkish get-up or Bulgarian split squat or all these other uh, very confusing exercises. Absolutely. And, and I would tell your audience, don't take Jay and I's word for this. Do it. <laughs> Do <laughs> right. it and you will see. Right. Well, thank you, Mark. I really, I really appreciate you giving us some really good insight on uh, strength conditioning in the NFL and um, how these, the high intensity protocol, which I hold so near and dear to my heart, how, how it can be applied to something like that. I just got a, um, one end question for you, something I'd like to get everybody's perspective on uh, before we wrap up. And um, so what is your, what is the biggest myth in the fitness industry today that more or less drives you nuts and why? Uh, well, I think this, one of the things that really drives me nuts is is the stuff on um, core training. Core training in our uh, in the fitness industry now has um, become the end, be all end all to everything. Okay, you know you got a bad back. Oh, you got to train your your uh, core. You got a bad shoulder. Oh, you got a weak core. You got to train that. You got a bad aim. Train your core. Ugly. Train your core. Uh, it's, it's become the be all end all of everything. And I've got a, some problems with that. Um, first of all, as a professional, whether you're a physical therapist or whether you're a strength and conditioning coach, it behooves us as professionals to use anatomically correct um, words and names. If you go to um, an, anato uh, an anatomy book, you'll never hear the word core because it, it doesn't exist. My question to you would be, where does the core attach? Where does it insert? Uh, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a nebulous term. Um, now, if you talk to, to me about the rectus abdominis, I could tell you exactly where its insertion and its attachments point is. I could tell you exactly what the movement is. I know exactly where that is. Core is, where is that? The only thing I know when it comes to core is, is uh, in the Marine Corps or apples have cores. And as a professional, I don't train apples. I train human beings. Uh, they have um, abdominal muscles. They have low back muscles, and they're very specific uh, muscles, and they have very specific movements. Um, that's, that's a real pet peeve of mine. Yeah, it seems, I mean, of course, it seems just uh, the fitness industry grabbed hold of this because... What is attractive in our society is a lean midsection. So under the mm -hmm. erroneous belief that if you train the midsection nonstop every day, you will develop this definition and have a nice lean midsection. But for, I mean, most of us know that that's not necessarily true. It's all diet related. So what I like to tell my clients as well is a couple of basic exercises, abdominal flexion and lumbar extension. That's your core. Would you agree with that? That's it. Well, absolutely, and, and I think the thing that's mo so disheartening about it to me is that you ask 9 out of 10 
personal trainers practicing in the field right now, what their number one priority is, and they'll throw this core thing out. Mm-hmm. And so what I will tell people, the core, like you said, is about vanity, but we are neglecting the most important muscles uh, in the in the neck region, and that's that's vital. That that could be life and death right there. So we're overemphasizing the vanity part, and we're under uh, underemphasizing the most important priority that needs to be trained. Yeah, it seems in this industry now, up is down, left is right, and uh, like you said earlier. You find the biggest person in the gym, someone who's in the most shape, and you follow what they do. And what I like to tell my clients is you find that person and you do the exact opposite of what they do. And you'll seem to be headed in the right direction. And um, my my advice, my recommendation um, to your audience, when you're looking for fitness professionals, look for somebody that's degreed. And even some people I've run into the industry that aren't degreed or that are degreed aren't, um, aren't the best either. But look for people that follow evidence-based protocols. Mm-hmm. Um, I think um, one of the best questions a trainer should ask the person that they're, they're interviewing right off the start is, you know, do, are you taking any medications? Do you have any orthopedic issues that I need to be aware of. If the person doesn't lead with those types of questions, I would probably, red flags would probably go up. And I'd, you know, I'd question the credibility of that person. So look for people like Jay, look for people that have uh, uh, evidence-based protocols in practice in their studios and gyms. Exactly. Completely agree. Well, again, thank you, Mark, uh, very much for explaining a lot of this confusion to us and to uh, other listeners. Now, uh, where can they find you? uh, Do you have a website and uh, to learn more about you and uh, and your uh, services? Or I I believe you do offer some online coaching services. Is that correct? I do. Um, My website is www.coachatrotraining.com. Dot com. Excellent. Well, thank you again very much for talking with us, Mark. And uh, I hope to spread your your philosophy on training to all my clients in the future. And uh, I actually learned a lot today. And I really appreciate you talking with us. Jay, it's been an honor. And I, I, I just want to tell you how grateful I am that um, there's people out there like you that promote evidence-based venues like this where people can go and learn. So um, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Appreciate it, Mark. Have a great one. Thank you. All right, you bet. Mark Sanovich, NFL trainer. We'll catch you next time on Fitness. You're doing it wrong. 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 You're doing it wrong.